So welcome back for the afternoon session. In the previous lecture, I, where I talked about the mission of the Waldorf School, I made the point repeatedly that this is much bigger than the school and I referred quite a few times to the relationship between the pupil and the teacher and not so much to what we're actually teaching. That's going to shift slightly in this lecture, which is more about the field that you're most familiar with, which is the field of adolescence. So we're going to look at what is it actually like to be a particular age and how is the world of curriculum and also the practice beyond the curriculum designed to answer those needs. So just like in the other lecture, you will find that it's still very much the child that is at the center of everything we do, only we no longer call it the child. <laughs> but now it's the young person or the adolescent or the person who is on their way into the world. So let's begin. You remember seeing part of this picture in the last lecture. So you, you'll know what this is a picture of. This is class eight, about two weeks before the end of their time with the class teacher. And this unspoken question um, that I was talking about in the last lecture is actually quite strongly expressed in their eyes if you look at it. They should really be quite happy because they're having a good time, there are no lessons involved, they're having a break. It's just at the end of a fairly long break on, on halfway up a mountain. So they're in a good space and yet if you look a bit closer at even beyond the smiles, you can certainly see a question there. And that question needs to be answered with a question from us, from the people who are there to meet them when the class teacher waves goodbye to them. And we have to be careful, especially in countries that have a, a strong regime tailored to examinations, that that is not the wrong question we're asking. <coughs> the wrong question would be, how are you going to fit into my expectations of you? How are you going to fit inside the box that is ready-made here? We have a box called French, a box called Geography, a box called Physical Education. They're the box that you, we somehow have to make you fit into over the next two years. The real question is, where are you going? What is your path? And to begin with, that's not a question which we actually articulate. But as you will see, there is a time in their development where we begin to articulate that as well. Being 15 is not normally an age which is massively enjoyable for long periods of time. If I think back on my development, I don't think I would want to cut out any of it, but I would like to cut out some memories. If I could choose a year or two that I can forget about, that I just don't remember, I would probably choose the time when I was 15 or 16, because I was in some situations where I did such awful things, such stupid, embarrassing, terrible things. I'm going to tell you one in a minute. Um, and I was rather heartened when I researched this lecture and I came across something Rudolf Steiner said about the 15-year-old. He says, being 15 is like feeling that the spiritual world has just spat you out. What a charming picture. And you feel a bit at odds. Many of you will be familiar with this situation. What do you think is going on here? Mother is a bit hurt. Mm -hmm. What could have just happened? What, what could they be talking about? Don't do what they expect from them. Yep. Yeah. What's the, what's, the young, what's the young girl trying to do? What could she be saying? I would like this and that. Mm -hmm. With, um, yeah. What, what were you about to say? Maybe discussing what time she has to be back at night. Uh huh. Yeah. 
She could be excusing herself for breaking the car up or smoking hash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's slightly younger than that, but you may be right. Um, what do you think the father could be thinking? It's a bit aggressive, isn't it? It looks, you know, like she's somehow new for him. Yeah. Do you know that phrase, who are you and what have you done with my daughter? Yeah? yeah. yeah? I don't know you anymore. Yeah? yeah? And the mother? She looks ridiculous. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, you see it. Yeah. I am so worried about you. Yeah? I'm so disappointed in you. I'm not angry. I'm only. I'm just disappointed. Yeah, you know the. You know the different phrases. So what? How, how is this going to end? Yeah. It's almost certain that these three people will walk away from that confrontation, and none of the three will be happy. And sometimes it is like that when you're that age. There's just nothing you can do right. That for all we know, these could be really kind, understanding, loving, educated, liberal, whatever parents. Yeah? But there are just times when it's just not right. And of course they love each other. But she can't make them understand. And they can't make her understand. Something very strange is going on there. And thinking, feeling and willing are all over the place. You're probably quite good at intellectual argument if you're that age. But you never, you don't, never quite know when to say what. And you feel inadequate a lot of the time. And there is one place, and probably one place alone, where you don't feel inadequate. Do you know where that is? No, it's your bed. You know why teenagers never get out of bed? People say it's about hormones and things like that, but I think that's the one place where they can't make any mistakes. Yeah? They're just lying in there and everything's okay. You know, they can watch movies or whatever. And yeah, everything's kind of safe in your bed. It's the way those, those two square meters, you know, nobody is, can get there, can get at you. It's not like your mom is going to get into bed with you and start carry on arguing. You go in there, you close the duvet over your head and you're safe. Yeah? And sometimes that's maybe why you don't get out of it till half past 12 or something like that on a weekend because you just want your safety there i was 15 once <laughs> and it was the first time my parents allowed me to go to an open air festival and that in those days was not a big affair it's not like glastonbury or something like that with a quarter of a million people this was quite a small open air festival and i grew up in quite a provincial part of germany it took place in an abandoned quarry and there were going to be about maybe two and a half thousand people there was one stage but there were going to be some bands that people had actually heard of okay so this was going to be a big thing and people were going to come from maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred miles away to attend this festival. And I had argued with my parents for weeks to be allowed to go and stay overnight. I was only 15, so I could sort of understand why they weren't so happy with the idea. And finally, by promising them all sorts of things yeah, that I would do to earn this privilege, they finally said yes. And then, of course, my friends and I, we planned and we had some alcohol and, you know, we had all these kind of things and it was going to be really cool and we were definitely going to meet girls, cool girls. There were three of us in a tent. And so we were there. I think the, the doors of the festival, the gates opened at three o'clock on Friday afternoon. The first band was only at eight in the evening, but, you know, we were there at half past two <laughs> waiting for the gates to open. And they did, and we went in there and pitched our tent right in the middle of the, of the campsite. And then once we'd sort of unpacked everything, got ready, we realized there was another tent just about maybe six meters across from us. And the people who put that tent up were from Berlin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, no, none of us had ever been to Berlin, but you know, this was really cool. Okay, capital and all that kind of thing. So, um, and m m some of them were girls, and some of those girls were cute. Okay, so this was, this was going to be the best weekend ever. So we waited for them for about five minutes or so um, to sort themselves out, and then we couldn't contain ourselves anymore. 
and each of us sort of targeted one of those girls and tried to chat them up. And I, I, I thought the girl I got was actually really cute. I, I liked her, she was very friendly, and she was quite open to being chatted up. And um, I remember she was, I don't have a re super clear picture of her, but she was blonde and she was curly, and her eyes were slightly far apart in her face. Just slightly, you know, just enough to make it really cute. And, and, and I thought, I've, you know, I just got to ply her with lots of compliments. So I said to her, I, I think your face is really cute. It's a bit like a frog's face. <laughs> Poor girl. Oh, no, poor girl, really. She burst into tears. She burst into tears, got up, walked away. Yeah? Well, so she, there were some other, she was part of a bigger group, but there were maybe about 10 of them or so. And obviously, somebody saw that she was upset and went after her, and my friend sort of realized that something, what's going on? I said, I don't know. You know, I just said, you know, I liked her. I, you know, I thought she was cute. <laughs> What did you say? I said, what? she looked like a frog. <laughs> <laughs> I like frogs. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so um, she didn't come back for a while, um, but her friends did and had a real go at me, you know, sort of shouted at me for making her cry quite rightly. And, um, and I apologized as much as I could and I tried to find her, but I couldn't find her and all that kind of thing happened. Um, and then my friends sat me down, and my friends said, you bastard, you know, we, you know how much we were looking to, for this weekend? So, you know, pack your stuff. And then I said, what? You know, we're, I'm, you know, we're together. I mean, uh, if, if, we, if we let you stay in our tent, you know, we are just as much a bastard as you are, so you're out. Yeah? So there's nothing I could do. I had to pack my stuff, you know, move out of the tent so they could stay friends with those cool guys from Berlin. You know, there was no way I was going to get forgiven for what I'd said to that girl. I never saw her again. Um, and you know, where do you go? Lots of people streaming into this festival site, but I had, no f I had no friends. I had no tent. I was 15. So what, do you, what did I do? I went back home. Can you imagine how that felt? <laughs> Knocking on the door at half past eight that evening. I'm back. <laughs> And my mom said, what happened? What happened? And what do you think I did? She said it was boring. Mm. Didn't talk to her at all. Where did I go? Bed. Yes, <laughs> exactly that. Yeah? <laughs> I went to bed. That was it. You know, I, was, I was done with the world. You know? and I, I, didn't, I don't think I came out of my bed till, till Monday. Um, and that's kind of it. I felt, you know, that, that sort of thing. You, you don't mean badly. But you just don't, you, do, you don't, you don't have the senses, you don't have the sensitivity to say the right thing. And when you say the wrong thing, you don't know how to make it good again um, mm. uh, when, when you're this age. And if, you're, if you have the great misfortune to live in a, in a country like this one, where you're actually being asked to make mature decisions about your future. So in, in Britain, for example, when you're 14, you have to choose which subjects you're going to, to study. Mm for the next two years, and that will determine which subjects you're going to choose for the two years after that, and that will determine which subject you will have at university. So actually, it all goes back to a decision you made when you were 14. Should you be trusted with making mature decisions when you're that clumsy? This is a picture of my son. Um, when you were 15, did you ever have to go, walk, go for a walk with your parents? He did. Um, we were on a beach in Devon, in the southwest of England, and he had to come um, because we were visiting friends and we couldn't leave him anywhere. And he didn't want to come, but he had to come. Um, and so, you know, he tried for, to find ways of getting out of it and he couldn't. And then we, we were chatting with our friends and suddenly I heard him call and I said, Dad, do you think I could jump down from here? And I turned around and I saw him standing halfway up one of those cliffs, and that is not sand at the bottom, that is sort of pebbles, yeah? a pebbly, a typical British pebbly kind of beach. And I said, you're mad. Don't, Leonard, come down, please, come down. And he said, no, I think I could jump from here. I think I could do this. How high do you think this is? Three meters? I, I, I'm sure I could do that. 
And I said, Lenny, please don't listen to me. It's not a good idea. You're going to hurt yourself. And he said, can't be bothered to climb down. Are you sure I, I can't? And I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump. And I said, Lenny, if you jump, I'm going to take a picture of you. And if you hurt yourself, I'm going to remind you with this picture every year for the rest of your life that you didn't listen to me at this moment. Okay? And he jumped. And he didn't hurt himself. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a really good picture out of it. So again, he made the wrong call. He just got really lucky. Yeah? He made the wrong call. Because that's kind of what that age is for. You make the wrong call. You, and why not? You know, you need to be able to make stupid mistakes in your life when you're not too young and not too old. Yeah? So if you're really, really young and you make a stupid mistake, you might die. Yeah? Because you're very vulnerable as a child. If you're really old and you make a stupid mistake, you might cause lots of damage in the world around you. So why not at this age, when you're not quite ready, but you're also not quite so vulnerable anymore? Maybe that's the best age for doing these kind of things. However, you are feeling uncomfortable in all sorts of ways. And now let's have a look at how the world of curriculum responds to that. If you, and many of you, of course, who already teach in the upper school and the Steiner school will know this. If you look at the curriculum, you realize class nine curriculum is full of really exciting stuff. Because what we're saying to the pupil at that age is look out, not look in, too painful. Look out, it's amazing what you can see in the world. So, for example, we have in the history of art main lesson, we look at the, the art of the ancient Egyptians and not least, the amazing facts about the Great Pyramid. You might think, well, Egypt's class five. Yes, that's true. But in class nine, we look more precisely at what actually the pyramids were for and what happened there. And you have these 230, 230 meters by 230 meters. So that's a long, long way. Any of you been to, to the pyramids? Yeah? One person? Yeah? So, two? Okay. So it's it's longer than you imagine, <laughs> okay? It it's, uh, sounds like a weird phrase to use, but it's really quite awesome. That's a quarter of a kilometer for one side, okay? And it's made from solid blocks, so that's um, 2,583,283 cubic meters of solid stone. And you know how they built that, but what I find particularly exciting is what they put in it. Sometimes to those chambers, but sometimes also in dead ends, are these diagonal shafts. And if you and I had to build a pyramid and put these diagonal shafts in to point at particular constellations in the sky, what we would do is we would build the pyramid, and then we would take a drill, and then we would drill down the pyramid and sort of line it up with that. That's not how the Egyptians did it. They calculated which block would go where, and then they cut the right angle into that particular block, and then they moved the block all the way up those ramps and put it exactly in the right place. Now imagine how many blocks you'd need to have a shaft that is 75 meters long, and at which angle the, that particular tunnel, which sometimes is only this big, would have to fall through those, those stones. How do you do that? Some very clever people might be able to write computer programs nowadays to be able to do that or to feed, a, feed this into a, into a 3D printer. But with the technology at their disposal, if you really think these things through, and that's what the upper school is for, of course, to really think things through, then it makes your jaw drop. That's so amazing. What, do you mean four and a half thousand years before Christ? No way. No, sorry, before us, before our time. That's amazing, and that's just the response we want. How cool is the world? Yeah, that might be worthwhile looking out of that. So, sacred geometry, class nine maths. You have the Fibonacci series, the golden spiral. And I won't go into the mathematical aspects of it now, but that's a thing, okay? Um, so it's a mathematical law that you find replicated in nature when you, have, when you look at the, the way cauliflowers are set up or certain flowery helixes and things like that. So you find equivalents in biology and then you start going back to art history with it and you realize, oh wow, the world of art is full of mathematics. 
Oh, that's interesting. But that's old stuff. So you come in the, the following day and you ask the pupils, so who of you has ever taken a good photograph? What makes a good photograph? And then you have a bit of a list and so on, and then you show them this one. Initially, without that red line over it, you think, aha, okay, so to take a really good photograph, you don't put the main subject right in the middle. You move it slightly to one side. Yeah? And, hey, wow, let's go and do some of that. So the day after that, they bring in them, or maybe they have their mobiles with them anyway, and then you go out and say, okay, now let's see if we can apply that. Yeah? Let's go out and find motifs that will allow us to use this so-called golden section for real. And then they get excited in looking out and discovering things out there. and They don't have to look to the place where it hurts. That's also possible to do in a more metaphysical sense. So this is what I've just shown you. It's very visual. But I'm personally a history teacher, not a maths teacher, when I teach in the upper school. And um, are any of you upper school history teachers? I know Sarah is. You are several people here. And then you'll know that on the curriculum for class nine, it says modern history. That's what it says in the main lesson plan for the pupils. So that's what they're expecting. So when I do that, the first day I come in, I say, OK, class nine, it says modern history on the plan. So where do we start? Make that the first activity. Have them talk to each other. Where do you think we're going to begin? When did modern history start? So let's imagine you're a class nine. What do you think? You've, you've gone through class eight, so you've got it all. You've done everything up to the beginning of the 21st century. You've got a bit of a fair idea about most things. What would you suggest if you were 15? You can call in. When is the beginning of modern history? Industrialization. 1918? Industrialization? Okay. Today. Oh, how interesting. Okay. Right now. Then we'd have to go backwards. That's an interesting approach. Okay. What else? I think my students say that it's uh, century. Okay. Any more suggestions? So, at some point, they want to know what I think. And I say, OK, that's quite easy. The 30th of January, 1649, at 11 o'clock in the morning. That's when modern history started. Now, Sarah will know what date that is. Um, maybe one or two others. Can you say it again? The 30th of January, 1649, 11 o'clock in the morning. That's when modern history began. Anybody other than Sarah know what that date is? It's a fairly English perspective, but there's a point to this, I, I, I promise you. Hmm? On that day, at that time, Charles I of England was executed. Okay. Well, you think, well, yes, what's so special about that? Kings have been executed before. Yeah? And anyway, it's an England thing. Now, how is this, you know, that's, how can you be so narrow? Well, as far as I know, this was the first time that a people of any country didn't have a revolution, but calmly and legally decreed that their king had broken the law and therefore had to die. This wasn't a wild mob that burned down the palace and killed the king. This wasn't a war. This was the people of a country saying, our king has acted against the law and committed treason, had a trial, and calmly condemned him to death. And this was in a society where the king was a representative of God. Deo gratias, it still says on the, on the English coins, by the grace of God. So what you're basically doing is, say, is not just saying the king has done wrong, but you're saying we no longer believe that there is such a thing as a divine right to rule. That the hereditary monarchy is, no, is not really justified. And that's what made it a modern thing. And that's what transcended it beyond being an English thing. These were people calmly saying, you have no right to rule us. After thousands of years, where kings and rulers had said, we're here because the divine world put us here. And with every new beginning, what happened was 
it didn't work. Yeah? They, had an, they had a civil war, they had a revolution, and what they put in place wasn't any better. So they went back to the old thing, but that's how history always works. Yeah? You, have, you have a try, something, you try something out, it fails, it goes back to the old things, but not quite, and the next time you do it, it gets better. Yeah? And you do it more thoroughly, and then that time it might work, or the third time it might work. So all revolutions kind of work that way. And why am I doing that in that way? Because it surprises the pupils, because I think, oh yeah, okay, well that's a quirky way of looking at it, and it sparks their interest, and of course without that, why would we even bother to have lessons at all if they're not interested? So, main lessons, of course, aren't the only thing that happens here. The passion of saying something is either black or white, it's either cool or wonderful, it's disgusting or it's super attractive, that is represented in, the, in a detailed study of black and white drawing. And then, once we've done that for a while, we can bring in the thought that actually grey is not that bad either. It doesn't always have to be black and white. Grey is actually quite interesting if you look at it. We work in copper with the pupils because copper is quite forgiving. If I make a mistake, I can sort of restore it. I can get it back. And if you're that age and you might, you're not, don't quite know the, your own strength, then that's probably quite a good thing. The same applies to basket work. It's not exactly easy, but it's flexible, it's forgiving. And one of the most important things in this year is when they're not even in school at all. When they go out and they work. And I don't know if that happens in Scandinavia. Do they go to a farm? Yes. Yeah? Does it happen in America? Do they? Yeah? In class 9, when they're 15. In, in, your, in your country when they're 10? In their class 10? Okay. So, these are pupils who've sometimes never been away from home and now they spend three weeks on a farm somewhere. And I remember one pupil coming back afterwards and giving a presentation about it and talking about it and he said, finishing his presentation, and for the first time ever I had the feeling that somebody actually needed me. And his mum sat in the first row and she went, so. <laughs> you could start by emptying the dishwasher. <laughs> but this was, here was this boy who got up two hours before breakfast and harvested leeks out of the frozen ground and did all these kind of things without having to be asked to sat up all night in the lambing shed with the farmer. Yeah, but at home, no, he's not going to get out of bed. But there he has the experience, finally, somebody needs me. So we move on to class 10. And of course, this is always slightly fleeting, but I was very fortunate in finding this wonderful photograph of a class 10. <laughs> <laughs> so, explain why you're laughing. I'm not going out with a crook. Everybody has the same hair. Yeah. Uh, I think I've been in the same shop. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the same trousers. <laughs> and then you also, all the yeah. girls have the same wrapping around their neck. Louise? Yeah, also they really, they're not doing whatever they're supposed to do. Like they're looking at the uh, authoritative picture, figure, like this is definitely Yes, I'm quite. Not going to do this. Imagine this is, yeah, sorry, Jakob? Yeah. Now imagine you've, you're a, you're a, you're, you don't ha know this class. Yeah? You're a cover teacher. Yeah, their normal teacher is ill. And you get sent in, can you take class 10 for this lesson? Yeah, and you walk in there and you're faced with that. And you don't know any of their names and it wouldn't do you any good if you did because they all look the same. And then you I've had lessons like that. Oh boy, you know, it's such hard work to, to get into class 10. So, however, they might want, they might crave anonymity. And you know, of course, that, um, you know, they tend to wear gray and dark blue and black colors and all that kind of thing when they're that age. But they're beyond, be, behind that there's something else. So they've been through this thing where things have been explained to them about the world and now they want to know a little bit more thoroughly what's actually going on. So knowledge isn't enough, insight now has to come. It's not just how does it work, but how do you know that it works that way? 
You're not our, you, you know, we don't, we're too old to listen to you just because you're a teacher. What are your methods? What does objective research say about these things? What are the laws that underlie this sort of thing? The 16-year-old really wants to know. They're really interested in the world of rules. Not least because they tend to be, or they're just on their way into a fairly deep identity crisis. What am I actually for? Who is interested in me? So there are layers on, on, and layers and layers of complexity here. If you thought the class 9 pupil was complicated, well, the class 10 pupil is even more complicated because they won't let you in. Yeah? They'll hide. And they'll find ways of hiding from you. Some of them hide what you call in plain sight. They put on a mask. This is the sort of age when, pup when, when pupils get into these kind of fashion things, the, the labels. Yeah? With some of them, it's literally just Adidas from head to toe. Some of them need a bit more than that. Yeah? And so you can't ignore a goth, can you? But what, what do you see when a 16-year-old goth comes past you in the street? You see a goth. You don't see the 16-year-old. You don't see the person, and that's the point. Yeah? It's an excellent hiding place. Yeah? This is a bit like when a, when a bank robber goes into a, goes into a bank with a limp. Yeah? He's not, there's nothing wrong with his leg, but everybody afterwards will remember a man with a limp, and that's what they'll be looking for. Yeah? So it's the same thing. Or, if you're more subtle than that, we're all a bit more familiar with that. Yeah? This is the other way that the class 10 pupils quite like to hide. Can I ask, what are, are their expectations? I mean, what is the, how, to do, uh, how to approach? I mean, what, do, what is the thing that you have to say that they are relieved? Uh, in mm -hmm. this age, what are the right words to this? My approach was to not make, that to make it too conscious that I am interested in them. Yeah? So I would not sit a class 10 pupil down unless it was a particularly individual situation and say, tell me about yourself. What's going on? Can I help? I would try and take a, take a more indirect route yeah? and explain to them and reassure them that everything has its order, everything has its place. And that will be an indirect reassurance because sometimes something might look quite drastic. Have a look at this poem. That's a bit shocking, isn't it? Why am I not worried about this girl? That's, after all, quite shocking what she writes there. She's articulate, at least she's expressing. Yes, because she's communicating. She's using art to communicate. Yeah? This is somebody who wants to say, can you perceive me? Yeah? You don't have to show it, but you know, I want to be seen. And I'm doing it via this, via this way. Um, and I'm not going to go to her and say, oh, I read the poem, you thought, I'm really worried, are you all right? You know? Because she's already expressed how she feels, she doesn't need that kind of feedback from me. What, does she, what she does need is my reassurance that actually it's, it's okay. I need to take the long view as an educator. The world is running according to rules and you can rely on those rules. And the class 10 curriculum is full of rules, regulations and laws. So you have physics, for example, laws of acceleration, laws of speed, velocity, gravity, earth rotation. The earth isn't suddenly going to get faster or slower. It's been going at, a sa at the same speed for millions of years. It's not going to suddenly change. Biology, genetics, maths, trigonometry. How do we apply the laws of maths to building and things like that, to planning things, to industrial, in industrial processes? So everything's reliable. And then we come to the most, uh, to a really artistic topic, poetry. And we say, we're going to study poetry. And some of the girls in the class go, yay, I love writing poetry. <clears throat> and if you're, if you're an English teacher, you know they write reams and reams, really long things, and call it poetry. And get quite offended when you tell them, actually, the art of writing a poem is to start with a lot and then make it less and less and less until you find the exact word that fits. 
Um, and you might bring them, do you know what a limerick is? So a preoccupied vegan named Chu picked up the wrong sandwich to chew. He took a bit bite before spitting in fried, oh my god, what the fuck, barbecue. And that's, why do we chuckle at it? Because it fulfills our expectations. We want a certain rhythm from a, from a limerick, don't we? And if it doesn't have that kind of lim rhythm, then we have a problem with it. There was an old man from Japan whose limericks can never scan. The reason for it is that he will fit as many syllables into the last line as he possibly can. <laughs> and he realized, okay, that doesn't quite work, does it? So good poetry follows rules as well. It doesn't always have to rhyme, doesn't always have to scan, but if we don't rhyme it, if we don't scan it, it has a different effect on us. So we can play little games with them. So this is a fairly famous English poem, and I've removed some of the words. Have a go. Can you see what's missing? So who would like to guess what the first gap is? Louis. Mm -hmm. So can you say the first two lines out loud? So it rhymes. Does it scan? So scanning means does it have the right number of syllables? It does, doesn't it? What are brief? Today and tomorrow. Okay. Let's have a look at the next two lines. Say the first line out loud but for yourself. It helps. Frail means um, fragile, um, easily broken. So what are we looking for? What are frail? Spring blossoms and youth. What are long, short? What are we looking for? Long, long short. How many syllables are we looking for? One. One syllable. So what are z, the ocean, and any clues? We, are we look, we're looking for something that rhymes with youth, aren't we? Yeah. So what could that be? Truth is a good choice. I agree. Yeah? So, what are frail, spring blossoms and youth? What are the ocean and truth? So now we need to find a one-syllable word that applies to the ocean and to truth. And it's, what kind of word is it going to be? Something Noun, verb, adjective, adverb? Adjective. Yeah, if it's, if it's the same pattern as in brief, it's going to be an adjective, isn't it? So, one-syllable adjective that applies to the ocean. Wet, okay. <laughs> what are wet, the ocean, and truth? <laughs> it's a possibility. Any other, any other suggestions? What works? Louis? Big, okay. What are big, the ocean, and truth? That could work. Yeah, better than wet. Strong. Jacob? Strong. What are strong? Okay, the ocean and truth, okay. So we've got two possibilities, two good ones. Any others? Say again. Uh, what are deep? Oh. Deep? Mm. Certainly. Would apply. It has to be one syllable. Something like constant or forever. Ah, good. So, so Lorraine brought in, actually, two syllables would work, to work as well, wouldn't it? Yeah. What are constant? Yeah, that would work. Yeah, that's true. So that, uh, that extends our range of... And you see, when you're engaging... Class 10. It, it, it communicates with heavy. With he heavy it, it communicates with brief, I think, rather than heavy. Um, but it could also, you're right, it could also be heavy. So we're having this conversation in class 10, and what is happening all the time? We're trying to apply certain laws, aren't we? Scanning, rhythm, rhyme, and of course also sense, anything we know about words. This is the original. That might, of course, not necessarily mean that Shakespeare or Rossetti or whoever provides the original has made the best choice, as, as uh, in this one. 
you can then say to the pupils, OK, you liked this, didn't you? Do you want to write a poem that we can use for that that is not from a famous person, but from one of you? So this is a 16-year-old boy writing. Do you want to have a go? Your time? OK, say the first two lines, Jakob. Would it be OK to take some of your time? Would you mind very much if I wrote your arrival? Are you happy with that? Yeah. OK, let's go on. Would you like me? Yes, would you like me? Say the two lines together. Would you like it, my dear, if I could make you smile? Would you like me to hold you a boy? Mm-hmm. Well, let me. Would you let me? Let me wouldn't work. Can you see why? Because of the two. Yeah. Yeah? So Eliora suggested a one-syllable word there. Does it have to be one syllable? Just check that. Could be two syllables. Yeah, so both would work, wouldn't they? Okay, let's move on. Katrina? Uh, would it be all right to find a way? Would it be a problem to long for a day? And it goes on the part. When I lean in close to. So when I lean in close, who wants to who wants to have a go? To whisper in your ear? Speak in your ear. Which is better? Why? Why speak better? Because of the rhythm. Yeah, this is interesting. Isn't it? Whisper is the better word because that's what we do with ears. But speak sounds better because it's shorter and, it, and that's what and that's interesting, isn't it? So it's not just the sense, it's actually the, the poetic laws that tell us here. Okay? And tell you our feelings are nothing to... Yeah. Okay, we've got a rhyme there again. Okay, who carries on? It's almost the same, not quite. Say again. Would it be all right, for example? Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that would work. To tell you there's nothing I'd rather do. I did tell you. He's only 16, poor chap. Did he write that for his mom? He wrote that. He wrote that for his boyfriend. Very sweet. Blushing furiously. But he had, he had the courage to actually stand up and say that in front of his classmates. Yeah? Um, his boyfriend wasn't in the class. That might have made it worse. Um, <laughs> so that, that, that helped, I guess. So. The big title, if you like, of class then, this is how it is. We can rely that the world is strong enough to be relied on, even if I myself am feeling a bit weak right now. So and a great uh, work on grammar also? Exactly. Okay. It's all about the rules. So that this poetics main lesson covers all those things, and they get, kind of get it then. Yeah? This, it's no longer free for all. There are, there are rules to art. And this is one of the most programmatic main lessons in class 10. And many of you will have, who of you has taught that one? Upper school maths teachers? Nobody yet? Yeah? No, no, I didn't. Yeah? So the surveying main lesson. When you look at a landscape and you find out what actually is there. And, and if, you have, if you get it right, then it's not just because you're playing at surveying, but you can maybe ask a farmer if he wants to have a road in his field or put a new fence up or build a barn or something like that. And he needs to know what the gradient of the land is. And this time, and you can see here, um, this looks like a fairly Waldorfy sort of map. 
but actually the person next to this person, their map should, should show exactly the same amount of trees. Because these trees should not be random. These trees should actually be there. Yeah? Should be reliably there. I didn't, it's not my pupil, so I can't tell you if that's the case there. But if I were the teacher, that's what I would point out. Yeah? Don't just make it pretty. And it takes almost one week, maybe two weeks to accomplish this. Three weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a long, I mean, the, this particular group, three weeks. Yeah. To, to really, even to, under, to make them understand the need for this. Have you done it? Uh, I've been with this yeah. course, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, it's almost, and quite often this is done for, for obvious reasons, it's done in the summer. So it really brings something to a conclusion. And if they can move on from here, you can breathe a sigh of relief. Yeah? They've, the hard bit is over. The worst bit of adolescence is now behind them. Um, if they move on, re they're really passing a crisis point. And I say if, because it seems to me that some people never move on from that 16-year-old self. It's also a time of excesses, binge drinking and all that kind of thing. You know, it's not enough to be drunk, you have to be catatonically drunk. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, or it's not enough to just, just jump off a cliff like my son did there. You have to jump off a cliff where you could actually die if, you, you know, if there's an unknown water or something like that. And you, and you go to these real existential risks. And some people don't move on from there. And some of them are leaders of countries, actually. <laughs> Yeah? Um, so if people uh, accuse a certain politician of behaving like a 12-year-old, I think that's a bit of an insult to a 12-year-old. Because a 12-year-old, as I showed you the day before yesterday, is actually quite sensible compared to a 16-year-old. However, let's move on. Because class 11, thank God. Yeah? If you're lucky and the first day of the class 11 year is a geometry day, it's a geometry main lesson. They may well come into the classroom and find this on the blackboard. What is the opposite of a point? Now ask that of a class 8, 9 or 10 pupil and, and you'd kind of go, what a stupid question. Yeah? <laughs> Do I care? A class 11 pupil goes, hmm. Try and be class 11 pupils. What do you think? Make a suggestion. What's the opposite of a point? A line. A line. Thank you. Could it be something else? No mm -hmm. point. No point. Yeah. No, no point. point. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay. Any other suggestions? Circle. 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 Mm -hmm. We have three now. Flat. Like a pencil point as opposed to blunt. You know what I mean? Like Not a point quite. on a pencil? Yeah. Which would be pointed surface. Yeah. A surface, yeah. yeah, an area. Okay, that's four four answers. Any more? Now, yes. Uh, the infinity. Very good. Yeah, five answers. Which of these five answers was demonstrably wrong? Which of these five answers could you prove to be not correct? Now that's an interesting question to ask a class 11. Because that's when discussions start. And they can get quite agitated discussions actually. Um, and what is happening here? What are we looking at? We're looking at the realm of the invisible. Yeah? This is the great theme for class 11. The invisible world. So if I draw a line on the blackboard, that's not a line. That's a part of a line. Because of course you can continue. And then you run out of blackboard, but you can carry on drawing on the wall. What do you do if you run out of wall? Is that the end of the line? No, it's just the end of the wall. The line could continue. Where does it go? And the first answer to that is infinity. Yeah, okay. And in the other direction? Also infinity? Yeah? But are there two infinities? A left infinity and a right infinity? 
Okay. But if it's infinity, it must include everything, right? So there can't be two of it. There has, there's got to be only one. And so you kind of work in this realm, and it gets intellectually really exciting and stimulating. Because you're looking at something that exists, but doesn't exist. In English, you study the romantics. There's a famous line in a poem by Blake to, that begins, to see a world in a grain of sand. To see a world in a grain of sand. To the 17-year-old, that's already enough for an essay title if you've trained them well. You know, there's so much in that. Just like in that grain of sand, there is so much to be explored, yeah? but it's not obvious to the naked eye that that is there. Have a look at this picture. It's by Turner. What does it show? <laughs> you mean this here? Yes. It's a dog as far as I know. But you're right, there are people here, aren't there? Okay. It's interesting that you chose to, put, to point out that, because that seems to be not the main thing the picture is about, on first glance. Uh, there's some kind of a storm, isn't it? Yeah? So it's a storm in the Alps uh, by Turner. Why does he put these people here? Same period, different painter. He's called Lodenborough. What do you think that painting is called? He's called Lodenborough. I've never heard of him beyond this picture. I don't think he was necessarily well known. What's the name of the painter? Lodenborough. Oh, right. Yeah. It's taken in Belgium. Yes. What the title of the picture is the avalanche. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it shows an avalanche. Why does it have people on it? And is that realistic? Look at the light and everything like that. It looks quite photorealistic, but is it an actually realistic situation? <laughs> it is a bit, isn't it? Yeah? So what these painters are showing is not really an, a natural phenomenon, but the human experience of a natural phenomenon. And just like with Turner, that thing is just way too big to even comprehend, isn't it? If you look at the comparison of this and this, you know, if that comes this way, they've got no chance. Yeah? The same here. Yeah? They are just literally five meters away from a huge, overwhelming kind of thing. And in that time, in the 18th century, British people began to go into the Alps and discover the Alps. This is the beginning of mountaineering in the Alps. And when the first Brit... You know what Britain is like. Well, you, you're in it. Um, if you get, then go to the Alps and you stand at the bottom of the Eiger North Face and you look up and up and up and up, a feeling stirs in your soul that you don't know from where you're at home. And they, they, have, they gave a name to that feeling. They called it the sublime. Now, chemists will know sublimation is if, if something stops being one thing and becomes another thing. Yeah? And this is the best those poets, those, those explorers could come up with to describe their experience in that kind of situation. There is an amazing thing that's happening. And I can't quite put my hand, my, my, a name to, to what that is. And when you study romantic artists, romantic poets with the pupils of that age, you can get into all kinds of really interesting things. And what they're doing, of course, the, all the time, and you don't yet have to make it conscious, is they're looking inside. It's no longer what, the, what you did in class nine by pointing out there. Now you're going inward, the invisible world, the soul. In music history, it's like Beethoven was uh, first yes. That was the time when a, a player could express himself yes. uh, instead of expressing King's feelings. Thank you for pointing that out. That's a, that's, that's a brilliant example because Beethoven, of course, has exactly that bridge from classic to, to, to romanticism. Yeah? Something from out here is being expressed now through art. And then we come to this amazing main lesson that you don't get in any other school, <coughs> and that's Parsifal. Why would you talk about some obscure medieval epic to modern 17-year-olds? How is that relevant? What has that got to do with them? And you th it takes a while to work out what the, what the purpose of that is. And because you see, Parsifal, can you just put up your hand if you know the story? Not everybody. 
Okay, so just in, in very brief outlines, Parsifal is a bit like a Waldorf child. Yeah? So his mother wants to protect him from the bad world out there, and she takes him and brings him up in the forest, and she is what in modern English you call a helicopter mum. Yeah? She's always there, and she doesn't want him to see anything sick or ill or dangerous or scary or anything like that. He's not allowed to watch movies or anything like that. He's completely protected in the bubble that his mum makes for him, because she's had bad experiences out there in the world. His father died from violence. And then he sees, he sees three knights in shining armor and he thinks they're angels. Because he has no experience to compare that with. But what he does know is, I want to be like that. I want to be a knight like that. And you know what? His mother has no power over him at all anymore. So this idea that she had that one day their roles would reverse and he would look after her, forget it, doesn't work. Yeah? She's not given him her, his freedom, and he now takes it for himself. And he goes off, and he has this great idea of becoming a knight. And we quite like Parsifal, a knight. Um, don't, uh, sorry, I can't translate into, into your language. but um, Ritter is the German word, yeah. Um, um, and we quite like Parsifal because he's brave, he's funny, he is imaginative, resourceful, and he has lots of opinions. He knows exactly what he likes, he knows what he wants, he knows what he's for. And then he has this strange encounter that is portrayed in this picture. He comes, to, he comes to a lake and somebody is being carried into a boat. Obviously clearly an important and rich and influential person. And then that boat goes out and they do some fishing and he, he clearly sees that person is not only powerful but also somehow sick. And a part, an inner voice says to him, I wonder what's wrong with this man. I wonder, what, you know, what is his illness? What is his sickness? So his heart asks that, but his head says, oh, you can't just go and talk to him. He's probably a king or something like that. And you don't just go to a king as an ordinary young man and ask him a question that's really rude. He might not let you become a knight if you ask that question. And so he follows into the castle, and he gets accommodated there, and he gets made welcome. But he doesn't ask that question. He never communicates with that king. And he wakes up the next morning, and the castle is gone. Had he asked that question, he would have received the Holy Grail that night. And the question is simply, what ails thee? What is your illness? What is your disease? How can I help you? Can I be of assistance to you? That's all he had. He just had to give vent to his humanity, but he felt he couldn't, he didn't listen to his inner voice. The moment passed, and instead of 80 pages, the book becomes 400 pages thick, because there's all these sort of things he, he now has to go through before he finally gets to see the grail. Yeah. So it gets really complicated. Now, what has this got to do with a 17-year-old? I don't know if, how closely you know 17-year-olds, but especially 17-year-old Waldorf pupils really know what they're good at. Some of them are juggling, some of them are computer gaming, some of them are playing the cello. They, and they have lots of opinions. Yeah, they're into climate change or they want to have lots of money. They really know what they want to do in the world. The question they haven't asked yet is this one. What does the world need of me? In other words, what ails you? How can I help? And you have these really powerful young people these really competent and vigorous young people in front of you, and somehow we need to help them to ask that question. How can I help? Do you remember in the other lecture, I started it by saying that Waldorf schools should not prepare young people for the world as it is, but inspire young people to develop that world and make it different. You can't do that if you don't ask this question. What am I for? And then and a really lovely thing happens in the curriculum, and again, I'm not quite sure to what extent this is picked up in your, in your country, but that is the social practical. So they have a work experience in a social institution. Do you do that? Yeah. yeah? So a Camp Hill village, a kindergarten, an old people's home, something like that. And you make connections with people whose extended facility you become whether that is because you tie their shoelaces or you take them to the toilet or you tell them stories, you make their life better. And you realize 
course, other people could do that too. But if I hadn't been there at that moment, that person's life would not have been improved. And that's a powerful experience. You suddenly understand that you can make a difference. And I speak, you know that young man who, who you saw jumping off the cliff earlier on, my son? Um, he went to a Camp Hill village in class 11, and he did this, and he came back and he said, I get it now. I get what disability means. I get what being different means, and I want to do that. I want to do my class 12 project about disability. And then he did a training in social practical, in, in, in social, social therapy, and that's what he works as now. He's a social therapist. He works with people with special needs. That started at that moment. He could have become a, a professional drummer. He could have become all these sort of things, a DJ and what other interests he had. But that's the thing he chooses. And it's, it's made me so proud as a father yeah, that he heard that voice that said, how can you help? What can you do? So we move into the last year of school, and then an interesting astronomical thing happens. And uh, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about astrology you, with you now. Um, whether you believe that the planets have an influence on our life or not makes no difference to what I'm about to say. But there is one particular astronomical thing that only happens about four times in our lives. Five if we're lucky and we live very long. When we are born, the moon and the sun and the earth are in a particular position respective of each other. Yeah? So the earth's here, moon's there, the sun's there. And then everything keeps moving. The earth keeps moving, the moon keeps moving around it. That exact constellation is reached again after 18 and a half years. And again 18 and a half years after that. And again 18 and a half years after that. It's called a moon node, N-O-D-E, that particular point. And a rather interesting thing happens biographically to the young people when this moon node is. And you probably know the image, the allegorical image of the moon as a mirror. Yeah? made of silver and it's sort of mirroring you because it's almost as if you see yourself in a mirror and you have a question about something quite deep and there's nobody you can ask that question of. And I've asked many people this and you might want to ask yourself that question and how your experience is about that. When you were that age, did something rather drastic happen to you or in your environment that gave you a moment's pause for, oh wow, I don't know what to do. In my case, somebody who, who I was at school with killed himself. He was run over by a train deliberately. He ended his life. And I wasn't, he wasn't a good friend of, my, of, of mine, but I'd known him for a few years. And the fact that somebody I knew could do something like that, just I, I, I didn't go anywhere for three days. I, I stayed in my, in my room and I played music and I lit candles and I did all sorts of things. But when I came out, I was a different person because I realized I have a question that I can't even put words to. But it's nothing I can ask anyone else of. I can't talk to my teacher or my mom or even my friends because I don't know what to ask. But something's really stirring in there. And some, I need to react to this, but I don't know how. And these things are biographical, you see. When I, when I talk to people in their late 30s or in their mid-50s or again in, in, their, in their early 70s, they just describe similar moments. Something drastic happens and something changes as a result of this. So this is the class 12 year, the last year of school, the year when you leave home, quite interesting in many, in many ways. And what do we have? We have an end of something. Many main lessons, in a minute, many main lessons in class 12 are overview main lessons. So a history curriculum class 12, everything. Yeah, an overview of the history of humanity. Well, great. Yeah. So how do I do that? Well, you ask the pupils, what are you interested in? Shall we look at the role of women from the beginning to now? Shall we look at money from the beginning to now? Shall we look at architecture from the beginning to now and see, look at those big pictures and see and have a look how things are? In biology, it's the theory of evolution. What actually is the difference between the human being and animals? And I'll come to drama in a minute, but Louise, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, well, it's just, um, so something really drastic happened in my life when mm -hmm. I was 18 because my mom died. But, 
I mean, that it's just, I think that uh, hopefully everyone <laughs> does not have yeah. bad experiences when they're 18, but um, it's just to understand what you were saying. Do you mean that because of this moon or something drastic will happen in your life? I'm very glad you asked that question. Because of that, I said what I said just before. I don't think the planets make that happen. But it's an observation I've had that in many people's lives, in that year, something like that did happen. And you, that could be a complete coincidence. But it's nevertheless interesting that it throws you into a situation where you're left by yourself. Yeah? And, and that's, that's all I'm prepared to, to go for. I don't want to make a theory out of it. It's just, a, it's just something that coincides. Coincidence means two things that happen at the same time. Yeah? Um. Like generally, it's like a shift. Like for me, that moment was I felt completely separated from my class. Like I was going in a direction, and my entire class was going in a different direction. And I, like, I, it, was, it was like, okay, I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a tragedy necessarily, but in, in, in its own right, it was. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's also good. So it doesn't always have to be quite as dramatic as, as, as our two examples. Yes, thank you. Uh, all your class went in a direction and you in another one. Yeah, mm -hmm. the experience, the, my experience in that moment. Yeah. And what was the home to the 18 years old for you? Yeah, just sharing that this moment of going into yourself and being like, you know, here I am in this mm -hmm. moment of a great shift and so, of something. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that was the outer manifestation of what we're talking about. That's a little bit different yeah. than, um, uh, you know, a close friend dying or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, I'm just wondering if if it means anything that maybe um, disasters, disasters can happen any time, but maybe yeah. after these periods of time, you could be more reflexive about yeah. it. Or, so maybe it's something that happens... And you and the same thing could have happened the year before, and you wouldn't really be so. Yes. Uh, of course, if you lost your parents. But yeah. It's entirely possible. And of course, big things will always leave a trace with you. Yeah. So, all I'm sharing with you is that because I've, I've talked to people a lot about this time in their lives, and ma many people have a story to tell mm -hmm. from that year, and it's, 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 I noticed that, mm -hmm. that many people have a story to tell. So, if you're a teacher of your native language, whether that's Russian or English or German or Danish or Finnish, um, you will probably have an existentialist novel to study. Um, so if you're, if you're teaching in Russia, this is the time to read Resurrection by Tolstoy. If you're teaching in England, you look at Hamlet. If you're teaching in Germany, you read Faust. I don't know what the Danish or Finnish equivalents of that Kierkegaard. would be. Kierkegaard, yeah. <laughs> so it's, the, it's an existential kind of time. You're thrown upon yourself. Any time before that you try and carve granite, you're not going to be very good at it. You know, you're not, not going to get good results because, you know, the stone carver, if you carve really hard stone, who of you has done that? Not soapstone or limestone, but like granite or something like that. What does it look like after a week? Oh, nothing much happened, honestly. Yeah, exactly that. So what, where do you get your motivation from? You're really thrown back to yourself. Yeah, you can't look at that for motivation. Oh, I mean, this is getting quite nice, like with clay or so. You're really, you really have to be in that place where you're with yourself. Yeah? This is, that's why stone carving is, is a class 12 activity. But the great thing is, of course, this class 12 play. And if you're lucky, and you're in the Steiner School, and there is a class 12 play, if you're lucky, your teacher's going to choose something that has real meat in it. Yeah, that, that has a real story to tell and real characters that will inspire you. So I think this is probably Faust um, with a Mephisto person there in the background. But even if that isn't the case, um, a class 12 play can be a wonderful celebration, a light-hearted, enthusiastic celebration of all the things that you've learned quite unselfconsciously out there. Yeah? After all, there are hundreds of people sitting in the school hall watching, and these guys don't really mind, do they? Yeah, they're out there strutting their stuff. It's funny, our class will script as well. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Now, one of my favorite things about the Class 12 experience, and I, I know I've referenced that before, is the Class 12 project presentation. This isn't one of my pupils, um, but you can see what he did his project on. He got into paragliding. Paragliding, yeah? So you jump off a mountain, uh, and that was, he was always a bit interested in that, and when he got given the chance for a Class 12 project, he said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to learn to do that, and I'm going to get good at it. Yeah, and then his, his teacher said, okay, well, you need to actually make something as well. And he said, okay, I'm going to make a parachute, and I'm going to use it to jump off something. And yet his teacher went, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> but of course, he's 18. You know? He's going to go his way. So he goes and to YouTube, <laughs> say, how do you make a parachute? And he take, gets the, his instructions from all, all sorts of places. Then he goes to the handwork teacher that taught him knitting when he was six years old. And he said, can you be my mentor for my class 12 project? And she says, yeah, sure. Oh, nice. Oh, lovely to see you again after all those years. What are you going to make? A parachute. <laughs> and I'm going to jump off a mountain with it. And she says, I don't think I can be responsible for that. And he says, no, it's, don't worry. I'm 18. I'm responsible. So, the negotiations with her and with the school and with his parents, you know, they eventually everybody backs off because they realize, you know, he's serious about this. And he does this, and he, as far as I know, he's still alive. Um, so, but look at what all the things that he has to do in this project. You know, not only does he have to learn to maneuver one of those things, yeah, so that there's a learning process there. He has to write about the invention of flight and the various flying machines. He has to research and demonstrate aerodynamics and, and demonstrate how those kind of things work. He has to make that thing. He has to understand how silk works and all this kind of thing. And then, of course, at the end, he has to stand there for 25 minutes and talk about it freely to an audience of potentially several hundred people and do so confidently. And why somebody like that then needs to go and have an Abitur or an A-level, I will never understand. You know? Because how much better can you demonstrate your competence in the world than with something as encompassing as that? With a, if you have put together a portfolio like that, even if you've done nothing for, you've demonstrated nothing in the 11 years before that, that in itself, if you walk into a university with that and say, this is who I am and this is what I can do, they should just be so glad to have you, shouldn't they? So that's the individual side, but there's more to it. There's also a social side. And I've not talked about that at all, really, this, uh, this afternoon. The social aspect of being a Steiner pupil. Ideally, you've been together with the same group of people for 12 years. What's happened in that time? How many arguments have you had? 12 years? 250 school days. That's 3,000 days of school with the same people. But in Denmark right now, we're having a discussion about this because we first opened our schools because it's yeah. a state curriculum. And so we actually have quite a lot of newcomers. Yeah. And they experience that the world of students are not very good at receiving many people because they've been together for so many years and have never tried to be a new pupil anywhere. Mm -hmm. okay. So actually that's quite an issue and I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's an important uh, thing to Can talk I? about because yes. we need to... Can I just open that up? Is that a universal experience? Yeah. That, that, that in Steiner schools yeah, they're not very good at receiving people in? We have maybe one third of the Steiner people there in the upper classes and two-thirds, at least, the newcomers. Yes. And usually the message is from the newcomers that they are very well uh, welcomed. So you have another, a different experience in your school? Do you think okay. there are twice as many newcomers? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's yeah. A big difference. yeah. But it, it still might be useful for you to, to have a yeah. conversation. Yeah. Because yeah, there are several other problems. Many of these things that we have seen now, they are like history for us now in the kind of in the situation that we are working yeah. now in our country. 
but that is not a problem. And we have had classes uh, that have had two thirds of the old old students and a one uh, one third of the new. And the situation has been the same. That the atmosphere has, mm -hmm. has been has been very welcoming. The the key thing in this is that you've noticed this. Once you've noticed it, you can do something about it. Um, my experience is is more like yours. That that um, yes, they know each other much better. But it's I don't think that means that they will turn their back on the newcomers automatically. So if you prepare it well, and and you need to find ways, especially if there's a large number of people coming in, it uh, in my experience it tends to work. They understand how to be welcoming. It may not be their instinct to be welcoming, not in every class, maybe. It's a real challenge, of course, if you have large numbers coming all at once. And, and that makes it really difficult. And what I'm showing you there is a picture from England. So, and we have many compromises in, in England because of the, the, the regulations here. So it's, it's far from ideal as well. And I hear what you say as well, that a lot of the things that I talked about, you might find idealized also. But the, the key question is not, why can't we do that? But what can we do? You know? So yes, by all means, take this as an ideal. But the question is, you know, if this is the spirit of it, what can we do to get some of that experience for our pupils? And that will be very true for the next thing I'm going to tell you, because you have to be quite rich for the next thing. Um, this is a picture from Michael Hall, just the other side of the valley here. And what happens there on, when, on midsummer night, on the 24th of June, is that the upper school perform a play outside in the grounds. And nobody below class 8 is allowed to come to that. Okay, so it's the other way around from continental schools where St. John's is for the little children. Yeah? In, in, the, in this country, St. John's is for the adults. Okay? So class 8 are the lowest class that are allowed to come to this. They see this play in the evening, and that finishes just before 11, maybe quarter to 11 or so. And then it, by that time, it's more or less dark. And then everybody goes to the other end of the school grounds where there's a big bonfire set up and waits. And there's lots of parents, lots of friends of the school. Everybody knows this is a special night. And then class 12 are all dressed in white and they have great big torches, flaming torches, at, one end, at the other end of the field. And they all stand in a long row. And then they come walking down this field and they have a sort of choreography with these, with these flaming torches and they end up standing all around the big fire and they say a verse about lighting a fire and then they charge at the fire and thrust their fire in there. Amadeus was one of those people who graduated from class 12 in this way. So was our daughter who was in the same class as Amadeus. And if you get your timing right, the next thing that happens is even better. And that once happened with my, my wife's class, um, who was a class 12 guardian, because they then do all sorts of things at that fire. They sing songs that they've learned all year to sing in four-part harmony. And everybody else goes home and class 12 stay there. They jump over the fire and they stay up all night. And then at 5 o'clock in the morning comes a minibus and takes them to the airport and they fly to Italy for a two-week art trip all around the Italian churches. Okay? So it doesn't often happen that the timing is so ideal, but sometimes when it does happen, it's really quite magical. Because then they travel and look at all these great Renaissance things in all these churches, and in every church they go to, they sing. Even in the Sistine Chapel or in Assisi, where all the guides say, silencio, silencio. Yeah? You have these charming, beautiful young people who, who sing a cappella Renaissance music and just transform the space around them. Ambassadors, really, of Waldorf education. And there is a certain amount of elitist quality about that, because not everybody can afford that. But then by the time you've known each other for such a long time, they also help each other to some extent there. It hasn't, I, don't, I have no memory of a time when somebody couldn't come to that. And again, it's the last time you see these people that you've shared 12 years with in that kind of setting. But will you lose contact? Not really. You'll never forget these people that you've shared such a long time with. Yeah? And you, you will go into all kinds of continents and to all kinds of countries, and that connection between you might stretch a bit thin, but it doesn't tear. Yeah? Eventually, it sort of zoops back together. I think, Amadeus, it was a 20-year 
anniversary for you this year, wasn't it? When uh, and and it was I saw pictures from that re, uh, reunion. His class was the first class, the oldest class I taught at Michael Hall, um, and and I could recognize them all. Yeah, there was there was a certain characteristic quality that they'd all maintained, and of course many of them have stayed friends till now. So to come back to this quote that I started the first lecture with, that Waldorf pupils don't fit into the world, well, it's not our task to make them fit. It's not our task to make them fit. It's our task to enable them to use everything that they've gained on this journey to transform the world. That's where we leave it for now, I think. Okay. Thank you. Let's get some air in here. <laughs>